morning, everyone, and welcome to FPC Online. Uh, I continue my series, Fresh Start, and today I'm going to be talking about serving others first. A little bit of a pun or a play on words, being as we are First Presbyterian Church, but I, what I'm going to be talking about today is that serving others is part of our DNA of uh, what it is to be a Christian, and certainly is is um, a reminder that uh, if we want to improve our 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 life and our spiritual life, that serving others is a key ingredient. But I'll get into that in a second. Uh, but first of all, let's uh, let's join together in prayer as we as we join together as a family. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, it is good to be together. And though we continue to be to uh, be in our own homes, uh, away from one another and from this sanctuary here at First Church. We know, Lord God, that you are joining us together through your Holy Spirit and that you are with uh, each and every one of us and together um, we are in you. So we pray that uh, we would be reminded of your presence in our life, uh, that uh, you are very much uh, in tune with what is happening not only in the world but in our daily uh, lives and what's happening in our minds and our hearts. And we pray that we would be open to your direction and to your teaching and to your love in every way, Lord God, I pray that through the Holy Spirit, uh, you speak to each and every one of us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So let me share with you the scriptures that I've chosen for today. Again, this, uh, this message uh, entitled, Serving Others First. Then uh, we'll sing a hymn. You can sing or enjoy it, uh, as whatever you uh, wish to do. Uh, what now be uh, back to uh, share with you the message that I prepared for today. From Acts 2, verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And from Acts chapter 4 verses 32 to 37. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Oh, to be like thee, full of compassion, loving, forgiving, tender and kind. Helping the helpless, cheering the fainting, 
deep on my heart. Stamp thine own image deep on my heart. So this is, uh, as I said a few minutes ago, a uh, continuation of my series, uh, Fresh Start. And it is a New Year's uh, resolution kind of theme um, because, as I've been saying to you through this series, that um, as much as we have this love-hate thing uh, with New Year's resolutions, the reason we do them is that we know that there are areas in our life where we need some improvement and we want to be in a better place, in a better position, whether it be finances or health or, or relationships. And certainly that there's no difference in when it comes to our spiritual life. Again, I don't, I don't, as I've said to you before, I don't really separate our spiritual life and our physical life. They're intertwined. But if there is an aspect of our life that sometimes we don't think about, it, it is our spiritual life. And so um, it does take, uh, it is beneficial for us to look at it and try to determine ways to uh, deepen our faith, to make it more life-changing so that it, what it, how it acts uh, or how it plays out in our life is, is, is one that is... Uh, stronger and more beautiful. Uh, as um, John the Baptist said uh, about Jesus, that John should decrease so that uh, Jesus could increase. And, and I think there's, there's something in that, that, that we should do whatever we can and whatever is in, in our abilities or in our power to allow Jesus to become more and more in our life. Now, when it comes to deepening our faith, if that is something that we desire, and again, it'll only happen if, if you wish for that to be true in your life. But if we have a desire to have a, a deeper faith, um, a fresh start, say, in our relationship with Jesus Christ uh, for the new year, the, the importance of serving others first uh, is it's vital. And frankly, it comes straight from the top. It's not something that I'm, we're just imagining or I'm making up for the sake of a message today, a sermon. Jesus said in, in a number of ways, but Jesus said, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He, he told his, 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 his disciples and his followers that to be uh, first, they had to be last, that they had to serve at all times. He, he told his disciples hours before he died that they were to wash one another's feet. That was something that was shocking to them because it would have been something that a servant and perhaps even a slave would do. It was certainly not something that their Lord and Savior would uh, assume that he is supposed to do to them and them to themselves. And goes on to say, uh, well, I actually would have said it earlier in his ministry, but it's recorded in Matthew 25, that, that we are to uh, feed the hungry and give water to the thirsty and to clothe the naked, to visit those in prison and to set the oppressed free. Uh, these are all part and parcel of what it is to be a Christian. And as I said a second ago, it comes straight from the top. It, it's, it's who we are. And I think it's, um, you know, when we think of the chapter of Matthew 25, where we feed and clothe and give water and visit the oppressed, it's, it's a much needed correction, wouldn't you say, uh, to the way the world runs. Because I was just reading, just for this particular message, that um, just checking my, my uh, figures, that 1% of the population of the earth uh, owns 44% of its resources. I mean, just think of that. One percent of the population of the earth owns almost half of the resources of the planet. Um, and and it's, it's a monstrous. I'm not saying that we can change this just because I'm talking. Um, I just want to remind us all, though, that, that it's a monstrous uh, state of affairs when so many people are facing poverty and upheaval every single day of their lives so that there is such an imbalance in in wealth in the world is is wrong. I mean, it does not surprise me that Jesus says to us that we must wash one another's feet and we should clothe uh, the naked and feed the hungry and give water to the thirsty and, and visit those in prison. It makes perfect sense. 
And, and um, in the scripture that I shared with you today was this, this whole notion of looking after each other, of not uh, hoarding everything uh, for ourselves because we think we're important enough that we deserve it. Um, this is something that the early church really took to heart. Um, at least within its community, but it grew. You can see in other uh, um, it, scriptures that I didn't uh, use today that the church was concerned with the well-being of the people around them. But certainly early on in the, in the, the absolutely brand new Christian church, uh, Luke records that uh, the people were worshiping together and breaking bread together, that is communion, um, and that they held everything in common and that they were selling their property to meet the needs of others. Um, <laughs> that often gets North Americans kind of nervous, right? And, and I'll be admit, I am, there's times where I just think like, should, should I be selling everything? And, and uh, should I be giving everything to the poor? And I, I'll never have a true answer to that. But, and I'm not adding this as a corrective to this or to get ourselves, you know, give ourselves permission to own what we own. But we'll notice that I read also from chapter four that land was sold as needed. I mean, people still had property, they still had possessions. Um, but their mindset, though, was that they would share what they had. And that is really beautiful. Um, it's, it's so different than the world. Now, you know, there were some hiccups. I didn't read these today, but there are, you, you're, you, know, you may remember the story uh, of Ananias and Sapphira that were uh, coming to Peter and telling them that they had sold their field and that they were giving the money to the, to the disciples to use, but they had kept part of it back, um, but they tried to pretend that they had sold it and that they had given all the money away. Things didn't go well for them. I won't go into that today. Um, you can find that story in Acts as well. But Ananias and Sapphira um, had tried to kind of look good. And, uh, you know, they were doing a good thing. I mean, they sold their land and giving money to the poor, but they tried to pretend that they had given more uh, than they actually did. Um, there were other hiccups, like um, Luke tells us that uh, there were complaints from the Greek-speaking widows uh, that they were being overlooked in the distribution of food uh, and that the Hebrew-speaking widows were uh, being looked after first. Um, Peter and the disciples decided very early on that they needed to have a group of people that would over, oversee the, the, the resources and the, and the looking after people who were um, uh, down in their luck. Uh, and they, they went on to choose uh, uh, men for that. Uh, again, I didn't read that today, but just to say... Even though it sounds idyllic, and it is, compared to where the way the world works, I mean, it was also very real, right? They were trying to sell their possessions. They were looking after each other. But the, the world interferes. The world gets in. And it's not picture perfect. But nonetheless, right from the very beginning, the Christian community knew that serving others was part of their DNA. And it's part of our Christian DNA to continue in that vein um, and you know what, as, as um, I've read over the years that, uh, and this is not just to just say, whoa, Christians are the only good people in the world, but many of the large charities and organizations that are still in existence today were, are, are originally were started by Christians uh, who wanted to live out the words of Jesus Christ and what they did and, 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 and by helping as many people as possible, by pooling the resources of people from large areas, right, through donations and then helping uh, people uh, in time of need. And I'm thankful for every organization that takes Christ's words and Christ's call to serve to heart, right? That, that this is why they do it. They're not doing it to look better. They're not, they're not going to, uh, you know, pretend that they gave so much money but keep some to themselves. No, they're working to be able to help others because there are so many, as I said to you earlier, so many people who are suffering under such incredibly uh, horrible situations. And they feel the call, the DNA in, in, their, in their makeup to serve them, to love them uh, in the most practical way possible. 
And so things like in our own denomination, Presbyterian World Service and Development, I've spoken about it a number of times uh, over the years. It's an incredible uh, agency within our denomination that seeks to help people uh, in countries where they are uh, experiencing all manner of difficulties, whether it's political, economic, uh, religious, uh, PWSND does incredible work uh, around the world. And, you know, agencies like that, and not just PWSND, but agencies like that give us the, the opportunity and the means to really share the blessings that God has bestowed on us on this incredible country uh, of Canada. I mean, we are so fortunate uh, to live in Canada. Uh, not that everyone has the level of... Um, economic prosperity that we have, we do have incredible problems in our country and in particular with indigenous uh, people. Uh, we have a long way to go and yet it is a remarkable country. We, we would have to agree in, in many uh, studies and surveys it's, it's considered one of the top countries in the world for, for standard of living and for well-being and for freedom uh, of, of choice and of politics. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll admit that I can take all my blessings here in Canada for granted. Um, I don't know why, I just get used to not being oppressed, right? Not being told what to do by people that I don't believe in, by I, I don't face, uh, you know, uh, eco, um, uh, food crises, um, none of that. And, and, after a while, I, I admit, I can take all of this for granted. And one of the things that I'm thankful for with organizations like PWSND is they snap me out of that kind of uh, thinking or, or taking things for granted. And, and I am using the word snap me out of it. <laughs> the reason I say so is that I, I really do, as a human being, can fall into this trap or tendency to just think of myself above others. And you know, we'll have all kinds of stuff about the self-made person and look after your own stuff first and you know, mind your own business and all of the things that we say to each other in our culture, which really reflect basically the ego to some degrees is that, that only I matter. Well, organizations that go out of their way to help others and to remind us that the world is not perfect, even right outside our doorstep, I'm thankful for that because, again, as I said, it, it, it snaps me out of my self-centeredness to only think of my situation or, or my challenges, that only they matter. Uh, or, or, as I'm going to talk to you in a second, is about taking credit for the good things that I do, right? So if I do do something, um, I, I, I want to be recognized for it. I, I, again, it's the ego wanting to be... Um, told how good it is. And not only do you take stuff for granted because you deserve it, anytime you do something, you want to boast about it. Um, again, Jesus is right on top of this. And this is why I shared the, the short scripture from Matthew uh, chapter 6. Jesus knows people. <laughs> He's our Lord and Savior. He made us. He understands how people function in, in the most profound way. And um, he taught his followers from the very beginning to do their good deeds privately and not to inflate their egos, uh, uh, not to boast about what they do. And I know this, this is an interesting thing to talk about because, for instance, some of the things that we do in church, like our breakfast or our backyard mission, we do promote them. We do put them in the news. Um, I hope, though, that we do so not as a not to say, look how good First Church is, but more to encourage others to do a similar thing in a world that needs so much uh, love from uh, one another. Nonetheless, it, it is it is a, a I don't know something to, to think about whether you know uh, whether we should just do things completely in private. Um, but Jesus has this point that he asks us to do that so that we don't inflate our egos. Uh, not like he, he, he points out the people who toot their own horn um, because um, you know why they're doing it? 
you know, he says the hypocrites in the synagogues and on the streets. He means everybody, right? Anyone who is a hypocrite, anyone who wants to show how good they are. He says the reason they're doing that is that they're more interested in looking good than in doing good. Can I say that again? Because this comes straight to back to you and me. Some people are more interested in looking good than in doing good. And ultimately, when that happens, when that mindset takes over, looking good usually trumps doing good. That person, per sons, will eventually just think about themselves and at times will fight back, just as the religious authorities of Jesus' day fought back against the most beautiful man in the world. How could they have ever thought they could get rid of him, crucify him, because they were more interested in themselves, ultimately. So again, he says, Jesus says, the reason, I mean, the reason he says, don't toot your horn, is that you don't, I don't want you more interested in looking good than doing good. And he's, he's, he's you know, Jesus is brilliant. He says, you know, when they do that, they already got their reward. I mean, that's what they were looking for. They got what they were looking for. They wanted to be praised in the street. They wanted to be told, hey, you're just number uno, man, numero uno. You are the man. You are the woman. They got the reward that they were looking for. It doesn't really help a whole lot of other people, especially when things don't go their way and suddenly they're cranky. They're mad. They're out of sorts because their way doesn't happen. They're not looking good. Now, I understand, like I say, I understand that we want to be recognized for the things that we do well and, and the things that we do for good. As again, like some of the ministries in our church, um, I think they do need to be promoted and they need to be put out there for, for the proper reasons um, uh, to encourage others to do the same. Right? I, I do think that's important because the more we can encourage uh, common love for one another, the better our, our community will be and hopefully our country and the world by, you know, the, the uh, how do you call it, just by, by virtue of people joining together in larger and larger groups, numbers, organizations, and, and helping the world at large. Um, I, I understand that we, we want to be recognized for doing good. We, we want to promote it for the right reasons. But here's the thing. Um, and I know I'm guilty of this, right? I, I know this in my own heart, and I, I think you would be honest to say this happens to you too, which is why Jesus says, do it in private, okay? Do your good stuff in private for God to see and nobody else. The reason I say this is it's important for us to think about is there is a fine line between doing good works and self-promotion and building up our own ego, Think about that. There's just a very fine line between doing good and thinking you're good. <laughs> you're better. I'm holier. I'm more giving. I'm more whatever. And Jesus is right on point here, trying to stop that from the very beginning, right? To know the difference... Um, between true charity and self-promotion. And this goes back to serving others, right? Because we'll never serve others if we're always serving ourselves first, or most of all, in fact. That if something happens to us that we're cranky about it, we, we react negatively. We're not quite as loving because the ego has always been the one ruling things in, in the way that we do stuff. So this, this whole bit about the ego is very much tied with serving others, with washing one another's feet, which, as I said earlier, to the disciples was shocking because it was something that even a slave would have done. How could it be that Jesus was going to do that? Peter didn't want any part of it, but I preached about this. I don't have to go into that today. But again, um, there, is, there is a fine line between true charity and self-promotion, and we can absolutely know the difference. And I'll tell you how it is. It's very easy. All we have to do is take a few minutes 
to think about, meditate, pray about our motivation on why we do things. <laughs> We're not so blinded by our own, you know, inability to assess our situation or to mine, you know, kind of our, our motivations that we can't figure this out. And, and I encourage you, actually, and not encourage you, but I just uh, ask you, like, um, if you want to know the difference between true love, true charity, and self-promotion and ego, just think about your motivation. Are you wanting somewhere, and I know it's hard not to do this, but I'm asking you, do you do this because you want to look good? You want other people to say, man, she's, she's something. He's the best. He's really Christian. Or do you do it because God asks you to love others the way you love yourself? <laughs> Let me tell you, it doesn't take a genius. I'm sorry, it doesn't take any scientific uh, equipment to figure that out. You can, in the quiet of your own thinking, you can say, what motivates me in general to do what I do? Jesus says, unless it is me who motivates you, unless you give yourself to me, you're going to let your ego run things too, all too often. Again, that's why he says that the hypocrites in the synagogue and on the street, that means everybody who's, you know, tooting their own horn and looking, saying how good they are. He says they're doing good uh, for the, you know, for all the wrong reasons. And in fact, they got the reward they wanted, which was praise. And I know people want to be loved, people want to be accepted, people want to be appreciated, all of that. That's, that is part of, you know, being a human being, you know, to be to loved, to be loved and, and appreciated. But Jesus knew that the people who were doing those things, tooting their own horn and, and doing things so other people could see them, all they wanted was the praise. And, uh, again, um, you know, when, when praise is your number one... Uh, reason for doing things, you can get pretty cheesed off very quickly when things don't go your way. And in fact, you can fight back and you can start treating other people like trash because you didn't get the praise you wanted. The ego, I mean, as wonderful as human beings are, the ego can be pretty ornery, let me tell you. And, and I only say this out of personal experience. I'm not saying like, hey, you guys, you, you got to snap out of it. I, I know what I'm like when I don't allow Jesus to take control of who I am at the very core of my being. And so, even though, I mean, serving others is part of our DNA, and it, it's important um, in, in a world that is so disproportionate in its uh, uh, allocation of resources, of, 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 of peace, and of freedom, um, serving others and washing feet like, like a slave, okay, um, it, it strips the ego of its command over our mind and heart. It kind of reformats us so that we do things for the proper reasons and with the best, the most beneficial results possible uh, because we don't get ornery about it. We simply do it out of love. Serving others and stripping our ego of the command of our mind and our, 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 our heart um, allows us to worship God alone. <laughs> and, you know, people hear about worship God alone, and I, I know I hear people talk to me about this, you know, not often just uh, outside of the church, um, but even sometimes people that are believers, they say, you know what, sometimes we can be kind of fanatical, you know, worship God alone. Um, you know, I, they, 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 it seems kind of weird to them, but I've said to you, you, you know, many, many times over the years, we're always going to worship something, aren't we? Something, someone, we're going to worship them and follow them. And it's part of life, whether it's just ourselves or someone we love or ideas that we want or wealth or uh, influence, position, a job. We're going to worship and follow something no matter what. Wouldn't it be better to follow Jesus Christ, <laughs> to give him everything? And to do everything with a proper perspective that, that he does it because he is God and he loves the world. He loves the world. Sometimes I think we don't believe God does that. We don't believe that 
God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. And that, that even more to the point that God could love us personally. Sometimes we forget. Well, when I think that God is love and, and he gave everything for us, I don't think it's fanatical to love him and to worship him alone as the Ten Commandments tell us. Worship God only. Worship God only. It's good stuff. Well, let me just wrap this up by saying when it comes to serving others, um, um, it's a way to worship and to serve Christ above all things. And yes, the world needs an equitable sharing of the planet's resources, for sure. Any way that we can do that, any way we can work together to lessen the load that people carry in their lives is, is a good thing. Anytime that we can serve others by not insisting on our own rights, and I, I remind us that in this pandemic, that folks continue to be good citizens and to uh, you know, wear your mask and do social distancing and um, uh, restrict your social circles. I'm so thankful that I don't hear you belly aching, uh, that somehow the COVID restrictions are uh, the persecution of our church. That's just nonsense. I'm so thankful you don't do that. I, again, thank you for not having that selfish attitude that says only we matter, our church matters, basically to heck with everybody else. Love God, serve others by letting go of our personal rights, your personal rights, and, and restrict our activities for a better future. And I pray that it will come and sooner than later. And remember too, then too, not only is it good to share our resources and think uh, uh, about other people instead of just ourselves, but know the love that comes from knowing Jesus Christ at the very core of who we are, that we will worship no other but him. Serving others and allowing Jesus to reign in our hearts uh, is a win-win in every way. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for all the things that I know you do privately. You know, we have conversations of the things that you do, uh, that our church does as a whole, I'm so thankful for the many ways you serve others. Continue to do that. These times are weird. We can't meet together like we normally do, but the gospel lives. And the call to serve others is very much alive. And I'm so thankful for everything from calling people and, and uh, you know, visiting vid by video, doing grocery shopping, helping with rides, all the things that you are doing. Thank you for doing that. It's such a blessing to the people that you love and serve. Again, to finish, to love God and to serve others, to have Christ as the center of who we are is a win-win. Well, bless you. And we're going to uh, take a moment now to uh, sing uh, or listen to a hymn. And uh, when that's done, I will pray with you. Okay? Let's do that.
Well, before we go our separate ways, even if it's by video, um, I do uh, pray that uh, your day is a blessing, that uh, as a Sabbath time, that you can take this time to refresh and to spend uh, any time that you can with uh, people that you love, whether it's uh, right to person to person or through video. I pray uh, that God will, God will bless you uh, and keep you always. And but would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you that in every way you are good. We thank you, Lord God, that even though at times we cannot measure up, you are infinitely patient and you are transforming all at the same time. You call us to you over and over again, no matter what we've done. And every time we come to you, you deepen our faith. You create in us a love that is um, purer and purer. Help us, Lord God, to serve others in every way that we can. Pray that we would do it um, right and across our dining room table, uh, across uh, the driveway, uh, in town, in the things that we do. Pray that we would do so uh, in every way, whether it means across the country or around the world. Pray that we would serve always, knowing that you, Lord God, served us, came to serve and to give your life as a ransom for many. We are reminded that your love is real. It's, it's amazing. You love us so very much. I pray, Lord God, that each and every one of us would take that love, um, absolutely accept it, be thankful for it, and be transformed by it then to serve you in the purest and most beautiful way possible. I ask this in your precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And again, I hope you have a nice day, and I look forward to seeing you face to face. I don't know when that's going to be, but I hope that is uh, sometime <laughs> this year and that we can join together without the restrictions that we have now, uh, that we can see family and friends. But uh, for now, this is how it is. And uh, I, I will speak with you again uh, next week through my message. As always, I'm always a phone call or an email away. Uh, God bless you. See you soon.